All right, we are back for part two of our discussion of the Medical Journal Editorship Collection. And I know we have oral histories of you discussing this topic in length, but one of the main highlights of your time with the Medical Journal of Australia from the perspective of the collection is the issue on tobacco published after you had already left for New York. I am wondering if there were any circumstances that led to the creation of this issue that you would like to go over in any further detail for those interested in the collection. First, the reason why we left was very clear. We didn't want our son to grow up and, and saying, good boy, dad. Uh, but you know, that's the joke that I would give people. I, I really love the accent. <clears throat> and um, I, I may have told the story of when I arrived, not having been there many weeks at all, I got a call. Um, and I would answer all my own phone calls. Um, Hello, I would like to uh, submit, uh, I, I would like to speak to the editor. I said, this is he. He says, I would like to submit a manuscript on the um, uh, Anzacs in the hospitals in Malta. And I said, excuse me, I I'm so sorry, I couldn't hear you. He said, uh, yes, it's on the Anzacs in the hospitals in Malta. Now, I had no idea what he was talking about. I, I could, I call it Malta, which I believe was a country, but I didn't understand what he was referring to. So I figured, well, like a good editor, I would say, well, why don't you just send it in? He says, yes, but I would like to know whether it would be published before I anzec it. Now, by this point, I, I'm not, I didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, gee, I'm so sorry. I have no idea what you're talking about. Could, could you just send it in? He says, yes, please, but I would like first to speak to the editor. Well, it turns out that Anzac Day is like the American July 4th. It's literally the day that uh, of the most serious defeat of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. Um, World War I united all of the states of Australia in a common armed forces that got beaten terribly uh, in the, I guess, the Bosphorus, wherever they, they were sent to fight and they were, they were brutally beaten. And it, this great defeat in World War I uh, is considered a, a, something to memorialize in Australia. And they have a war memorial in Canberra, a beautiful um, monument and museum. And so it's, it's, the, it's everybody gets off that day, but I didn't even know what Anzac Day was. So um, uh, that, would, that would typify being an American, the only American that the uh, journal ha has ever had as editor in its uh, now 120, Two year history. Um, but the, uh, the other story was when I was invited to uh, give the centenary address at the Austin Hospital in, um, uh, or the Flinders Hospital, let's see, the Austin Hospital in Flinders, I think, in near Melbourne. And I got this call one day Would you like to be the keynote speaker at the 100th anniversary of this hospital? And I didn't know what to say other than, Well, I'd be honored. But picture the scene of my being new, maybe two months in Australia, and I'm the one chosen to give a speech at the 100th anniversary of the oldest hospital in Melbourne. And got there, and everybody's in formal attire. I just had a suit, and I'm sitting at this table, not knowing a soul there, although I did recognize the head of, the, uh, of one of the research councils. And... Um, I was asking my host, I, I said, finally, I'm so sorry, I don't really understand. How is it that I was selected to be the speaker? So, oh, well, my dear, were you, let me just say, you weren't the first. I said, really, I figured that. Said, Who else did you? Well, first we tried the, the head of the opera, Dame so-and-so, so but she couldn't do it. And then we tried the head of the ballet, Sir so-and-so, so-and-so, and he couldn't do it. And he went down a list of about 15 people he said, well, we're sitting around not knowing what to do. We've only got two months to go. And somebody said, why don't we get the editor of the old medical journal, whoever he is? And that's how they called me. Um, but it turns out that the one guy I recognized, and I didn't know from exactly where, turned out to be the head of the Tobacco Research Council, which was the tobacco industry funded uh, research organization that I had criticized already in the Medical Journal of Australia. And my talk was about uh, how the tobacco industry is, is, is hurting the country. And he was sitting right, right in the front of the audience. But uh, this was the whole year was like that. It was, I got to be the American bloke in this, uh, in this foreign country, uh, traveling to every state except for Tasmania. Um, and um, 
I, I, I just really loved the country. I, I, I thought it was a marvelous uh, adventure. Uh, my wife left, however, after nine months, she couldn't take it. Um, it was tough being 10,000 miles away from your relatives. So our son Leon and Doris went back to New York where by this point I had been interviewed by the editor, by the uh, head of the New York State Medical Society, better known as the Medical Association of the State of New York, which had heard that I uh, was an editor, had been the Fishbein Fellow at the Journal of the American Medical Association. And in May, I had actually flown back to the United States to interview just as in case things didn't work out. I really wanted to stay in Australia. We, we thought we would be there three to five years. But by October, things were looking pretty bad with a lot of bossy uh, publishing people and drug companies. And uh, I checked with the people in New York and saw that the offer was still open and I accepted the offer. And that's when Doris left to go to New York to, uh, to uh, set up house and, and we, we moved to Manhasset. But really the, um, uh, the, the things were in the pipeline for the smoking issue, which was March 5th, 1983, after I left. But we agreed in my negotiations that Calvin Miller, who was the medical writer that I hired, um, would finish the issue. He would be in charge, not Kathy King, uh, but and no one else. They agreed to that. And so it was almost done when I left, but he pulled it all together. And that was considered the last issue that bore my name. Uh, I had edited all the issues up until March 5th, 1983. So in effect, I edited about one year and two months worth of issues as the editor. Um, the um, the issue of March 5th, 1983 turned out to be the, the only issue in the entire uh, history of the journal to go to a, to a second printing. So this was that issue. I was able to commission the, um, the editorial cartoonist from the Chicago Tribune, Wayne Stasekel, to do what I think is the only editorial cartoon ever to appear on the front cover of a medical journal. And it shows two people walking down the street and seeing a couple of kids, a few kids smoking behind a billboard. But every one of these billboards all over is for a cigarette. And the, the guy is saying to the wife, uh, you can try to keep kids from smoking, but I guess peer pressure is just too great. And I'd sent Wayne pictures of all these billboards and things. He didn't know anything about Australian brands and he read up on it and he created this, especially for the Medical Journal of Australia. And uh, it went into a second printing. Um, it, it really turned out to be a, a very popular uh, issue that got a lot of great attention, uh, but I had already left. One last thing that I would like to ask in relation, direct relation to the Medical Journal of Australia is, can you speak to what was going on with it's there's multiple references to several turnovers after you left and i was wondering if you can speak to that especially as it relates to calvin miller who you hired as assistant editor because i was personally struck by how much what happened to calvin Mir calvin miller mirrored what was later happened to you at the new york state journal of medicine i was curious to know if you could speak to that a little bit well, Cal Miller, who was a brilliant medical writer, uh, he had been, um, he's an American from, uh, graduated from the University of San Diego, I believe, University of California, San Diego. He uh, is from the San Diego area. He went to Australia. I wanted to, always wanted to go there. I got a doctorate in, um, in, in um, some area of science, I think related to biology. But he loved writing and he loved jazz. One of his children is named Django after Django Reinhardt, the, the great jazz um, musician. And um, he, uh, I, when I advertised for a medical writer, because my idea was to create a section called medical news where we would have more of the, the current medical news going on or feature articles. I think we called it uh, news features. Um, he applied and we just hit it off instantly. He, he, uh, he moved from a small town. He and his wife moved to Sydney and uh, Cal just wrote up a storm. He was fabulous. And um, today Cal Miller runs one of the great medical publishing houses in Australia. He's a self-made man. He started this publishing company called MyCom 
where he uh, publishes medical journals for other organizations and publishes uh, newsletters for physicians' offices and patient education material, uh, really making a viable world of the print medium. He's, he's a terrific human being as well. So after I left Australia on January the 1st, 1983, um, and a very humorous experience because, um, uh, which I'll talk about in just a minute, um, an article appeared in The Lancet uh, saying another medical journal editor uh, resigns. And it was a very brief four or five paragraph thing talking about the turmoil again at the Medical Journal of Australia with the resignation of yet another editor. Um, and it spoke that it said that I had brought the journal back to um, widespread uh, popularity among the medical profession. It was a very nice editorial. To this day, I do not know who wrote that. And it was more of a news from Australia. It wasn't an editorial, but it was a regional article written by somebody in Australia. And um, as the result of that, um, there were a series of letters that were published a couple of months later in The Lancet, um, commenting on that, that an editor's note. And one set came from the medical journal from the deputy editor who I had uh, who's, who I had originally uh, hired and who succeeded me as the interim editor and the medical publishing house, basically blasting me and blasting everything I had done and uh, saying that the account of the medical editors leaving was not true. And uh, whether they said I was fired or he didn't resign, but whatever it was, I definitely resigned. That, that was not in dispute. But the other letter in that section of The Lancet was from Calvin Miller, who thanked the journal for publishing that because it really set the record straight because he could vouch for every single thing in that uh, letter and that editor's note having occurred. The day that that uh, letter of his was published alongside the other letter, uh, in effect, his letter refuting everything that they said, he was fired. And uh, they didn't count on his being a member of the um, Science and Journalists Writers Union. And he made an appeal and that union brought suit against the uh, medical publishing house. And they wound up settling for a certain amount. They tried to fire him um, and, and just kick him out, but they wound up paying him, uh, I think a, a reasonable sum for um, his work and, um, and they were not able to get away with it. I had to write a letter vouching for him as well. So uh, Calvin is a man of integrity and one, one, a great human being. And, and I was so glad that he wrote that. I never asked him to write it because I didn't know that anyone in Australia would write anything about it. It was, it was true as far as I saw it. It was a nice little note, but he took it upon himself to, to thank The Lancet for publishing it. The transition from one editor role to another with the Medical Journal of Australia to another with the New York State Journal of Medicine. I'm curious to know what prompted your interest and acceptance of the position and with the issues you faced at the Medical Journal of Australia, if you had any apprehensions about taking the new position. The Medical Journal of Australia is what's known as a second tier journal. The first tier journals are the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the British Medical Journal, the Lancet, and a few others. These are where if you're in academia and you want to publish in a prestigious journal, you really want to aim your sights high and you go for those main uh, journals. Uh, often the Medical Journal of Australia, in addition to getting journal articles from Australian physicians who are loyal to their country's medical journal would get a lot of uh, rejected articles clearly because you would see what we call the multiple staple sign. They would simply restaple them and turn them over to the next journal. And uh, that's what we had to deal with. Um, so my role was not to keep, was to try to turn something that might not have been as acceptable at JAMA or New England Journal or British Medical Journal of the Lancet into something that was really pretty good. I have a lot of faith in authors and I would work with them personally to make it a better article. So I was very proud to take articles that had been rejected elsewhere and to make them into acceptable articles with peer review at our journal. That was a lot of work. Uh, and the other part of that work was going to the different medical schools during the course of that year, going to um, uh, 
uh, Brisbane and, and to Melbourne and to Adelaide and to Perth and meeting with medical people in uh, universities, even the Melbourne, um, the Victorian Medical Association to convince people to submit to the Medical Journal of Australia. And I got to see the country and, and, and meet people, but it was very difficult. And that was difficult enough, but I knew that the New York State Journal of Medicine, which nobody had ever heard of, but which is, was actually the exact same age as the Medical Journal of Australia, it was exactly 82 years. Uh, they had both been started in 1900. Um, I know that, that that was on its last legs. And so I would be going from a first tier journal at JAMA, where I was a Fishbine fellow, to a second tier journal at uh, the Medical Journal of Australia, and then going way back to the United States to a third tier journal that literally had multiple, multiple staple signs before you ever got any of those manuscripts. So I had to do this all over again, convincing people in the medical society and in the medical schools in New York to please try to consider the New York State Journal of Medicine as one of their issues. That wasn't really working that well. So I thought of theme issues like I had done in Australia. We published several theme issues in Australia one that was started before I got there on methicillin resistant staph aureus. Um, and um, we, there, there had been a traditional one on Aboriginal health. And um, I did the one on smoking and that was, uh, you know, it turned out to be a good move. And so I did the same in New York. We did an issue on minorities in medicine and we did one on the offshore medical schools and one or two others. And I was able actually to devote three full months to the issue on smoking by not publishing three issues in 1983 so that we could gear up to produce the biggest single issue that had ever been published in the New York State Journal of Medicine. And that issue of December 1983 was widely acclaimed and it, it made good on my promise to help revive that journal. But leaving the medical journal was, was not an easy decision. I, I wanted to stay till the very end I was even willing, and Doris was even willing to come back if we could work things out, but it wasn't heading in the right direction. I was asked to uh, edit another journal while I was there editing the Medical Journal of Australia. They said, well, we'd like you to edit the Australian prescriber. And that was the equivalent of what's called in this country, the medical letter, a neutral objective evaluation of new medications. And it was started in the 1960s in the United States as a result of the key Kefauver hearings on the ethics of pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical advertising. And in Australia, the Australian prescriber was published by the Commonwealth government as if not entirely neutral since it was the government as opposed to a private company that wasn't taking drug ads. But the, the, the medical journal coming out of, this little medical journal coming out of, of the government was, was uh, quite, ethical and um, the integrity of it was impeccable. So with a conservative government, there, a deal had been made with the medical association to privatize the Australian prescriber and they wanted me to put it in the middle of the Medical Journal of Australia, like in the centerfold, surrounded by drug ads. And I said, no, that's not ethical. I couldn't do that. They said, what if we made you do that? And I said, well, if you've made me do it, I'll resign. And, and that's what I did. But um, I did have one secret source. I, I had uh, a wonderful fellow at the journal, one of my most valuable staffers. He was the custodian. Uh, he was the janitor. His name was Alan Bray. And Alan was a cockney from England, but he was always looking out for me. He was the one that told me that I didn't have to accept that Murphy bed that came down from the wall. He says, they need to find you a better place to stay. And one day I took his advice and I didn't show up for work. And they called me and said, where are you? I said, well, I'm, I'm at home until you help assign me a realtor to find me a better place to live, which they did like that. And he also said, doctor, he says, you know, doctor, he says, you know, that little uh, uh, Honda Civic you're driving there. He says, you're supposed to have the Accord. You're not supposed to have the Civic. They're supposed to give you the better car. And the publishing manager, he's supposed to have the little one. Well, uh, I, I had forgotten that one of the perks of getting a job in Australia is you do get a vehicle. And uh, so I, I didn't care for the vehicle that they'd given me. But lo and behold, I, I said, you know, I understand I was supposed to have the Accord, which was a much bigger and better car. And so, oh, that's right, we forgot. And so they, they gave me the better vehicle. But that was due to the janitor tipping me off. And then one day toward the, the end of my stay, 
he looks around the room. He comes in, doctor. He says, can I talk to you, doctor? I said, sure, Alan, come on in. He says, doctor. He says, they're out to get you, doctor. I said, what do you mean? He says, you're having a meeting tonight, right, doctor? You're having a meeting of the publishing company. I says, that's right. He says, well, he says, I heard him planning while I was cleaning the urinals. And uh, I'm listening very careful to what they were doing. And they, they're going to ask you to do something tonight, doctor. They're going to ask you to, to edit a new journal. So he had tipped me off to this whole thing while he was cleaning the urinals. And uh, uh, I was well prepared uh, for this, uh, what was supposed to be a surprise attack. And I held my ground and they had no idea how to respond. I said, well, I'm not going to be editing something that is unethical. And they hadn't thought of that. So we debated a couple more weeks and I did finally resign. But um, that, that pretty much uh, gives the story of, of the medical journal. Chris Hood, I may have said hurt, but Chris Hood was my secret weapon in that last two months. We spent several days together writing this editor's report. Um, and he had just this impish sense of humor and he was a brilliant writer, but um, he was really one of the highlights of my stay in Australia, in addition to taking the train across the country on the uh, Indian Pacific. That was three nights and, and four days on the train. An absolutely marvelous trip that I hope everybody in the world can do. And it really gave me a flavor of Australia. I then took the GAN, which was the other train from Adelaide to um, I, uh, to um, Ayers Rock uh, or Alice Springs is where that's located. And uh, on the flight back from Ayers Rock or from Alice Springs to Sydney, when the plane landed, there were all these reporters with flashbulbs and, and as we're getting off the plane and I didn't know what was going on. I'm certainly, there, I knew they weren't there for the Medical Journal of Australia editor, but they were there for, um, Lindy, uh, the woman who was uh, played by uh, the actress Meryl Streep in uh, the movie in which uh, her baby was stolen by the dingo. And um, she was later, after we left Australia, she was later proven innocent, but she, was, she had just been convicted. Uh, and I was on the same flight with her, unbeknownst to me, she was in the back um, and she was being brought back for a sentencing in Sydney and uh, about to go to prison. But um, th things like that happened uh, in Australia, meeting the people from Bugger Up, speaking at this 100th anniversary of this oldest hospital in Melbourne, um, going across uh, the country on the Indian Pacific and speaking at the Charles Gardner Hospital. And then the next day, the doctors who were in the audience marched on parliament to support a bill banning cigarette advertising. Um, really, really a fascinating experience. Uh, the whole, every day was different and uh, the journalism was very lively. I loved reading the morning papers, the Melbourne Age, the uh, Brisbane paper, the Adelaide paper, even the Perth, uh, it was called the Western Australian, uh, a liveliness to this journalism that will never be again because one by one, even when I was there in 1982, I saw the last um, of the old a printing press journals uh, run off the printing press. It was a tabloid and it was done by the old uh, hot, uh, hot letter press where the, you would have the actual lead type uh, that was melted. And, and it was that was the last printing press like that was taken offline uh, the year that I was there. So I was there at the very end of a culture of journalism that will never be there the same again. Um, and it was run by the Murdochs and the Packers and a very vibrant uh, news war in Australia. But um, uh, they even took after me by condemning me for an editorial I wrote about the use of the of Prince Charles and Lady Diana in a Benson and Hedges ad. It looked just uh, what it was, was they wrapped around a cover of the, one of the tabloids welcoming them for their trip to Australia. There was their portrait and all around them was this cigarette ad uh, that was wrapped around the day's newspaper. And um, I, I talked about juxtapositioning of the royal family with a cigarette company. And the editorial in the Canberra Times said that nothing pink, perpinks like perpinquity. And the editor ridiculed my suggesting that the royal family was being used by a cigarette company. 
Moving on to uh, the New York State Journal of Medicine, as I understand it, it was a rather small operation. I think you kind of spoke to this as well. And the publication had not received much attention by the time you had got there. But the first tobacco issue of you did with them, the December 1983 issue, judging from the letters, the number of letters of high praise from the co collection, it is tr proved to be an instant hit, even more so, I would say, as indicated by the Philip Morris internal memo warning that this was a, quote, virulent attack on the tobacco industry, unquote. How much effort did it take to bring such a small institution, such even international attention through such a notable piece? Well, when this issue came out, um, this was it. This was the first of the two theme issues, the world cigarette pandemic. Um, it was a very, very long process. I worked nights, weekends, and holidays, and I did it under the radar. I don't think had the medical society, uh, nor, nor would the medical society in Australia have ever thought, uh, once, once we published the, the, this was the bugger up cover, once this came out in Australia, um, they were really looking at me more closely. They did not want this issue to come out. And uh, to think that we did get the other smoking issue out is, is truly amazing because this was not done with the great support of the Medical uh, Association of Australia. Uh, they, they did bask in the glow of it a year later and they were very pleased that it came out, but they, they did not support what I did on, against smoking as editor of the Medical Journal of Australia. And the same thing in New York. I mean, they didn't know what to make of me. Uh, I used to joke that I was not only the youngest member who would go every month to the board meetings of the Medical Association of the State of New York, I was like 20 years younger than the youngest member. Um, I was the youngest full-time medical journal editor in the world at that time. And one of the reasons I did accept the New York State Journal position was that there were very few offers anywhere in the world for a full-time editor. This was the last of the state journals of medicine in the United States. Of course, the New England Journal of Medicine is technically published by the Massachusetts State Medical Society, but this was the last state medical society that had a full-time editor. And uh, knowing that this was a rare opportunity, I took the job and, and it got Doris home closer to family and it got me back to the United States. By the way, the titration point was one day I was sitting in a milk bar and these two Australian medical students were right behind me saying, boy, I'd give my right arm and my eye teeth to be able to go to the United States. And I'm thinking, wow, I have a medical license in the United States and I'm sitting here, not the happiest person in the world and I'm not seeing patients. So I went back, to, that was the moment I said, I've got to go back and maybe even resume seeing patients again one day. But in New York, uh, the Medical Association of the State of New York was not hostile. Uh, they were very hopeful that I would really help re revive the journal. They wouldn't have hired a full-time editor again if they didn't want, but I was replacing a, a, a wonderful man who was in, well up into his 80s by the name of Alfred Angrist, and Dr. Angrist was such a renowned pathologist that his students over the years at Albert Einstein College of Medicine actually created an Angrist club to salute him and to have an annual meeting in his memory. So I was filling tall shoes, but it had been many years since Dr. Angrist was at top form and the journal had slid. Uh, there was one manuscript that, that was published. Um, actually, I was able to prevent it from being published, but it was in its galleys and it was on uh, sadomasochistic sexual whatever in auto asphyxiation. And we're talking, I mean, graphic content here that no medical journal in even Philip Morris would, would not find this journal as bad as what we were gonna publish in the New York. So I was able to stop that article from being published to, to the wrath of the author, by the way. Um, but, um, they, unfortunately, the, 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 um, the fellow that hired me retired right after I got there. So I was no longer sort of his hire. And the fellow that got in was really nice. He was supportive, but he died suddenly in office um, only about a year after I got there. And he was succeeded by an interim 
uh, executive vice president who I felt was an inebriate and one of the old school medical journal polit politicians who um, you probably wouldn't have wanted to have as your doctor. I mean, it just, just uh, you know, uh, putting the economics of medicine first and foremost. You know, those long hard years of medical school, we deserve an income. But I, I was able to do things under the radar. And uh, this issue came out in December 83. And I immediately started getting those letters saying, this is so amazing, because nobody had expected much out of the New York State Journal. And um, um, one of the letters came from Dr. George Gitlitz, who was the author of a series of letters to the New York Times in the medical journal, uh, where he would argue that um, the Times should really stop accepting cigarette ads. And um, so we, we produced, I, I visited him in Binghamton, I spoke up there, and he told me he'd written all these letters. So it was called Cigarette Advertising in the New York Times, an ethical issue that's unfit to print. And he showed me his kitchen drawer where he had all these letters to the New York Times saying, please don't take cigarette ads. And none of them was ever published. And so I collected some of the examples of cigarette ads in the New York Times, and I wove his letters throughout this. And by the way, we sent this to the New York Times and they wouldn't respond. Um, and I published these letters and he called me and he said, you know, if you never do anything in your whole career, he said, this will suffice. So I was very pleased, but that day I determined if that's the case, I think I better do a better one. So two years later, we published this one, which was almost one and a half times as big. I wrote to every medical society in the world. I uh, solicited many, many articles. By this point, we were getting articles over the transom from people who'd seen this first issue and wanted to write for this. So this was actually not as hard to get articles for. Uh, but we talked about ethics and we talked about uh, uh, the different influence of the tobacco industry in different countries. We talk about the tobacco industry going after kids through the Parent Teachers Association. Um, anyhow, uh, these two issues were my legacy and the New York State Journal of Medicine. We have another timer counting down. I have at least two more questions a little bit longer that I would like to ask if you have time, if you want to start one more session and go through it. So let, let's do that. I just want to say, by the way, that um, as a coda to those New York State Journal of Medicines, in 2010, I got a call from uh, Dr. Anderson, who was uh, the editor of Social Medicine. Uh, actually, he's still, Matt Anderson, he's still editing this journal. This is an online journal, but uh, he'd heard me speak and he'd seen the New York State Art Journal of Medicine articles and he wanted to do a tribute to my work on smoking. And the first article, uh, he said, can we reprint some of your articles? And we contacted the Journal of American Art, uh, Medical Association, which would not give permission to produce the first piece I'd ever done for JAMA called Medicine versus Madison Avenue. But we did contact, actually, I contacted the Medical Association of the State of New York and they gave permission even though we didn't part on good terms, to uh, reproduce a uh, couple of articles, including Dr. Gitlitz's and my editorial. And they did a salute to uh, that issue uh, 25 years later um, in the issue of social medicine. So the, the, one, the one other unfortunate story about the New York State Journal of Medicine is that I walked in uh, in December of <clears throat> I walked into the office in December of 1985, uh, a day or so after Christmas, and uh, was told that the, uh, uh, the executive vice president wanted to meet with me. That was this uh, inebriated fellow that I mentioned. And I walked into the office and it, without any uh, introduction, without any formalities, he said, oh, I wanted you to know that I've, I've, um, I'm replacing you as editor. I mean, I had a new house, a, a child on the way. Uh, uh, I hadn't taken my boards in family medicine and I was up for recertification. I hadn't seen a patient in seven years. And boy, that was quite a blow. And I, 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 was, I, was, I couldn't even speak. I, 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 and, and I was totally caught off guard. And I said, can I at least know who my successor is? Yeah, I've asked your deputy editor, Dr. Imperato, to take over. Well, that was a double blow because I had hired him. 
And I, I, it turned out that I didn't understand what he was doing, that he basically engineered that position for himself. He needed extra income and he maneuvered himself into that job. And I, it was confirmed when I contacted Dr. Bill Fagey, who was head of the CDC. And I wrote to him and asked him if I might get a position in Washington that he could help me with. And he said, well, what happened? And I told him and he said, uh, uh, you mean you had Imperato as your deputy editor? You didn't know about the plagiarism? And so I've talked about this in other stories, but I, I had hired a plagiarist or someone who had been accused of plagiarism by the American Public Health Association. And uh, it wasn't surprising that this was the guy that took over the job, which actually they closed the journal not too long after that. They finally closed it up and, and ended the journal within a couple of years. So it, it was good that I did get out. 